Good morning, everyone. Good morning. So Tony's taco truck will be not over here, but over there, because I think once he comes in, he won't be able to get out, right? Because uh, if you ever um, try to drive a trailer backwards or forwards or sideways, it's not that easy. So he'll be parked right in the front, and so you can go pick up your breakfast and or, or snack and go over there and continue to fellowship with um, others around us. Um, I, I will be here next Sunday. And so um, after both of our services, I will be driving to San Francisco and, uh, and fly out. And, and I will just miss one Sunday. Um, but so Gabby will preach on 26th. And the following Sunday, we'll have a joint service. Uh, that is um, on the weekend of Labor Day weekend. Right? And so that we have a joint service. And that Sunday, Ryan's going to speak. You know? And so Ryan is our... Our, um, I call him like Tim Keller of San Luis Obispo, you know, and so, uh, so have a high expectation in him so he can uh, really play, pray and play and, uh, and, and prepare for a wonderful, um, uh, Tim Keller is one of my heroes, uh, did I say that, uh, Ryan? Uh, so uh, I'm expecting great things from all our people. Um, I remember going to Guatemala uh, with Neo and uh, Ryan, Neo said, yeah, pastor is really working on the working on the deep bench, and I didn't exactly understand what that meant. But you know, we have a lot of bench. You know, like uh, when I'm gone, so other people can preach for us. It's a pre- for, preach for instead of me. It's, it's a blessing to have that 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 I can. Uh, so on the second of September, I will be here. Uh, but Ryan's gonna preach for us, and um, yeah, so it's, it's wonderful. So today uh, I'm gonna speak from Book of Jude. And again, Book of Jude has only one chapter as well. And uh, next week, I will speak on Revelation. So I haven't figured out how many times I'm going to actually speak on Revelation. Uh, maybe once, maybe twice, maybe three times. I don't know. Uh, but uh, today, uh, so, we're, so we're almost done with the whole Bible that we've been going through. So please pay attention of what's in the Book of Jude. And as you probably know, Jude was a half-brother of Jesus, right? And so sometimes, you know, we don't really think about a lot of things that we already know. So, um, you know, when, when you read these kind of things, like, oh yeah, you know, Jude was a half-brother of, of Jesus. Do you think Jude was a younger brother or the older brother of Jesus? Younger, right? You know, it's just obvious, right? You know, so sometimes, like, when, that, when you're not thinking, like, I don't know, you know, <laughs> you know, Bible doesn't say it, but it was younger because, you know, Jesus born from a virgin, you know, Mary, so that was ev- everything else, or everyone else, it was a half-brother of Jesus, was younger brother. And also, um, Jude was a full brother of James, uh, not, not James the apostle, but James the church leader, right? And something um, interesting about Jesus' physical brothers is that they didn't really believe Jesus um, when Jesus was ministering. Right? It, is, it is only after Jesus rose from the dead, right, the half-brother of Jesus began to believe in Jesus and follow Jesus and live as a uh, Christian in that time. So it is interesting to know that even seeing Jesus up close and even all the you know, miracles and the ministries of Jesus that they got to witness, it wasn't until the resurrection of Jesus that they became followers of Jesus. That's why the gospel is so important. The gospel that Jesus died for our sins, that he was buried and that he rose again, which provides us a proof of who Jesus was. Right? Not all the miracles, but it was the resurrection of Christ. It solidifies who he was and what Jesus has done. So uh, I have three points for us uh, regarding in book of Jude. Is the, the purpose of the letter. Why did you, Jude write this letter? And the example of people who perish. Why, why, you know, when they don't believe in Jesus and they perish and all the examples that Jude gives. And also three specific applications based on the purpose of this letter. Okay, let's get to it. The first is that the purpose of writing this letter is given in verse 3. 
Right, give it in verse 3. So when you, let's read it together. Ready, go. Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. Right, so Jude is writing this letter. The whole purpose is to appeal to the readers, appeal to us to contend for the faith. Faith is not just simple of uh, believing in Christ, but our whole Christian experience, right? Our entire life in relationship with God, right? So this word content is very interesting. I, I practice to say this word again and again in Greek. So I um, transliterate it right there. Apago ni zomai. So ni is the kind of emphasize. That's why I put capital, in, you know, capital letters. So let's all say that together. Apago nizomai. Once again. Now you sound very smart. You know, now you know a couple words in Greek, right? So when you read that, right, the, the, there's a, a one English word that you can see in there. You see that? It starts with A and ends in I. What is that? Agony. Agony, right? So the, the word, the content, it actually means to exert intense effort on behalf of something like agonizing agony right not agony just in suffer but what are you pursuing hard right it's not just automatically is happening but it's understanding how valuable how important this is and i'm going to put a lot of right intense effort exerting a lot of in, intense effort in you know the thing that uh, Jude is talking about. So, the contending for the faith, how we ought to exert intense effort in, 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 in keeping the faith, the pursuing the faith, the having this uh, relationship with God. This word was used for a athletic terms, you know, for athletes. But you know athletes, right? How crazy they are. Right? They have to watch out what they eat, what time they go to sleep, or, or how they need to exercise, right? Right? And you know, what places they go. They're, they're very intense in the ways that they live their life. Why? It's because they have a goal. They have something they're, they're contending towards, right? Because they're content, contending towards certain goal or cert, certain activities where right? they are exerting intense effort in doing so. Right? Yeah, and this is that's important. And even for the military term, to fight against how they are always trained and how they are ready, right? When the bugle sounds, depending on what the bugle is saying, you got to go out and fight against the enemies. The exerting of intense effort, right? And so you have to ask, why? Why are we told or commanded to exert intense effort in, in, in keeping our faith, right? That, that question is given in chapter, uh, verse 4. So when you kind of read it, it can uh, easily understood. So the reason is that when verse 4 talks about, for certain people have crept in unnoticed, unnoticed, who long ago were designated for this condemnation. And who are these people? Ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only Master and Lord Jesus Christ. These people have crept in. And again, this is not like people who do not believe in Christ just come once and for all and just say something that is very, very contrary to what we believe. But just imagine, uh, maybe they were like that, but how they come and little by little, little by little, because if they are you know, speaking something very contrary to our belief system, we can pick up right away. You know, but how they come, they crept in unnoticed, and little by little, they are influencing the church. Right? They're, they're, they're compromising the church. So some people have come in the church and have influenced the church to be corrupted in some fundamental and foundationally negative ways to defile the church to be ungodly, pervert the grace to be sensuality. This word sensuality, you know, in Greek is actually um, of um, grace to be 
a license, you know, to do whatever you want. Right? Remember, I always talk about the grace path of the gospel is this, you know, I don't want to say middle path, but it's not, right, legalistic. It's not licentiousness, right? It's not legalistic. It says we do, we have to do certain things in order for us to be approved, you know, by God. Or it doesn't also mean that you get to do whatever you want to do because God has forgiven us all things. But it is the appropriating the gospel. And so when we appropriate the gospel, people sitting on the licensure side, right, they may see the gospel path and see, hey, you look very legalistic, right? But when you're sitting on the legalistic side, right, and seeing the gospel path, oh, you look way more free. You look too licentious. Right? You know, so, but th th that's the thing. That's the different perspectives that it provides. So it's very important for us to understand, you know, the gospel path. You know, it's not what it seems in our eye, our own perspective, but what does God say? And that's why we need community in order for us to tell us or give us feedback or so we can, we can speak unto them and they can speak unto us so we can find out, right? You know, two brains are better than one. Three cores are better than one core. It's uneasily broken, right? It's so important how God has given us this community so that we can check each other how we are walking in this gospel path, right? And so, so these three kinds of qualities, right? They are ungodly, uh, right? And, and one un, or, or godless, right? It means that people who live without reckoning with God, right? Living as though God doesn't exist. No consideration of God at all, right? It's like atheists, right? And then, but when you talk to atheists, how can you affirm a negative? How can you know for sure that there is no God? Do you know everything in this world? So when you say you're atheist, or you know, some people say they're atheists, they're just saying, I know everything in this universe, right? And how prideful, how arrogant that term is, you know? So then when you say that to a, a somewhat uh, honest atheists and they say okay I'm not atheist anymore I'm agnostic I just don't know right? and so right away in five minutes you can turn a atheist to agnostic right? praise the Lord for that right yeah, yeah. so you gotta use logic in some sense right and so these ungodly people have no consideration of God at all right? they live life as though they are their own God even though Bible says the creation indicates so much hints of God's power Again, Tim Keller talks about, you know, in his book, Reason for God or Reason of God or something like that, right? Talks about how God has given us a lot of hints in the universe of how he exists or, or, and, and the power that he has. Now, it's not a proof, but it is those hints. So when you connect together, you connect those dots, then you can see, oh, 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 right? You can see a lot of hints together gives a somewhat good proof of that. And Romans 1.18 talks about the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Suppressing the truth by their wickedness. In order for me, for us to do more wicked, they have to suppress the truth. And that's what these people uh, live. Right? And the second trait is that this, they pervert the grace to be um, sensuality, license. And since God has forgiven us, I do whatever I want to do. Right? And that kind of mentality. You do whatever you want to do, then you just say a simple prayer, oh God, forgive me. Like that kind of thing. Right? And, and they're not understanding the, the word grace right. And that's why... Uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, right, he coined the term of cheap grace. Everybody say cheap grace. It's not the grace that God intended, right? And when, when, when he talks about cheap grace, he's thinking that the grace given by God is just a license to commit all kinds of sins rather than seeing grace as a fuel. They enable us to live a life of holiness. Live a life of Christ likeness. Live a life that is glorifying to God. Live a life that for, you know, fills this universe with the characteristics of Christ. That's totally different than license to do whatever you want, 
right? And, and, and the understanding this grace of God that coming over us, influencing us, giving us a fuel for us to live as how we ought to live. Because in every culture, we have a ought. We ought to do this. But in every culture, we don't. Because we all fall of the, you know, the, how the community have decided how we ought to live. Right? Even in the ways that we decide to live in, you know, in San Luis Obispo, we have, you know, also, it's not in the laws in some sense, but I know who's from San Luis Obispo and who's not San Luis Obispo. People who's from San Luis Obispo, we don't honk. So one time I, I almost honked, right? And my, my dad said, uh, my, my, my son said, Dad, are you okay? And I said, why? I said, I, I, I almost felt that you're going to honk. Because this, this you know, person was coming and almost hit me. So I, I was kind of getting ready to honk, right? Well, oh, I'm here, you know? And my, my son says, oh, Dad, are you okay? You know, I said, why? He says, oh, I felt like you almost honked, you know? Uh, and I go, oh, see, he already noticed. Uh, right, then we'll go to LA, we honk all the time. In India, honking is a way of driving. In India or in Pakistan, honking, you have to honk because you, you're letting them know, I'm here, bing, bing. Bing, bing. Oh, it's, it go drive you crazy. <laughs> you, know, you know, but as Cal Poly stars, we have many people from LA to, and from San Jose, Bay Area, people honk all the time. I say, okay, I know that person is not from San Jose, well, right? And, and that kind of thing. We are, the, but we don't. In every culture, we have that, right? So understanding that we have, we are, but we don't, and that's why we need grace. We need God's grace in order for us to match with what we ought. And that's the grace that God gives us. That's the fuel that God gives us. And when we read in the, all these commandments that God gives us, all these commands that God gives us, we come to a point where we ask, oh, God, do this in my heart. Please give me the fuel. Give me this understanding and give me the energy for me to exert intensely for me to do this. That's why we need God's grace in order for us to live such such way that God prescribes to us. This is a relationship with God, right? You know, John 15, 5 says that he is the vine, we are the branch, and we got to be connected together. Where we get the fuel from, where we bear fruit from, and without connection, we can do nothing. Right? We can do nothing. And that's why even in Great Commission, right, it says, no, for I will be with you forever. Why? Because we're not good enough. You know, you learn how to ride a bicycle, right? And your mom or your friend or your dad comes behind you and just push, 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 push. And you be paddling really hard. And you look back like, oh, there's nobody there. Ah, boom. You know, you fall a couple of times and you get better at it. Right? I, I fell many, many times. I learned how to ride bicycle when I was sixth grade. You know, that's how poor I was, you know. Yeah, we, didn't, we didn't have a bicycle, you know. Yeah, but anyway, right? And, and, and what the Bible is telling us, you're not good enough and you'll never be good enough. You'll never be able to do this life by yourself. You're always in need of me. And that is grace where God comes inside of us. Right? That is the grace that where God comes alongside of us and gives us the fuel in order for us to live such a way. Isn't that, isn't that wonderful? Yeah. God loves us so much that He is willing to be inside of us. He is willing to be in, 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 in us and, and, and alongside of us, helping us to live this life. And that's why it is a commitment that we have with God in, in the connection that we have with God. Yeah. Luke 9, 23 says, Then He said to them all, Jesus said to His disciples, If anyone who come after Me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily, and follow me. Whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me will save it. Yeah. And, and these people, they pervert the grace of God. Right? To think that they have license to do whatever they want. Because Jesus died for all. And obviously, when you are in that camp, we don't understand the true definition of grace. You know, I'm not trying to condemn you. But in some sense that it is a growth process. Maybe you begin, just begin your relationship with God, right? Maybe, you know, Luke 15 talks about the two sons and the older son and the younger son, 
right? Younger son didn't know any much, you know, I'm the younger son, you know, kind of thing. Not, we don't know everything, everything in the fun kind of thing, right? Right? And, 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 and he didn't understand how much God, how much the father loved him. And so he just took off. He told his dad, hey, give me all my inheritance. He's not even dead yet. I would say, like, get out of my house right now. You're not taking anything. But so somehow, you know, God, the father kind of gave to them. And so, like, so it really shows us, right, that when, maybe when you begin this relationship with God, you have incomplete view of his grace. But we cannot remain there. We have to grow out of that. How does God's grace, how is God's goodness and His love, right, that transforms us to be more like, drive us to be more like Him, not perverting the grace to license to do all kinds of things, but seeing grace as fuel for us to accomplish what God desires. It's the fuel, and we need that fuel each day. And sometimes in the ways that we counsel one another, right? Oh, you know, people are struggling or discouraged. And what do we say? Right? It's like a car with no gas. Right? What do we say to those cars? Uh, Shape up, boy! Get some fuel and go. You have to bring, bring fuel. You have to go to the walk, walk to gas station or something, you know? Or, you, or, or call Chipotle or somebody. Uh, you have to put the fuel in there, and only fuel, uh, it comes from the Lord, because you can do nothing without the connection with God. So we have to help one another to be, to people to be connected with God, so the God's fuel may be, right, maybe in their tanks, in order for them to live their life. Th does that helpful? It's so helpful. Because all my life, in the beginning of my Christian life, that's how we do Christianity. Hey, suck it up, boy. So people who are very disciplined, they seem very spiritual. Right? And people who are not very disciplined, they seem very unspiritual. Right? Right? But it's not, it's neither or. Because sometimes some people are very good at in certain things. Right? Right? And when you see the old, oh, that person is very spiritual. Right? But it's seeing and receiving God's grace in order for us to accomplish His will. And, and the third uh, characteristic is that they deny Jesus Christ as our only Master and Lord. You know, Jesus is the second person in Trinity. Jesus is God, right? Who is the owner of all things. Right? In the beginning, it was the Word who created all things. And some people may not like the fact that Jesus is the Lord, but the Christians, right? We like the fact that Jesus is the owner of all things because He's in charge. You know, maybe when you are little, you may wish that you are in charge. But as you get a little bit older and older, you realize, man, I don't want to be in charge. Huh? I don't want to be in charge. Yeah. I, I just want to listen to somebody. Because I know some people who used to be like um, like associate pastor and maybe they got a job promotion and became senior pastor. And they go through this intense pressure of now I'm the like number one dude of this organization. Right? But what they are forgetting is that they're never, it they're, doesn't matter what, what, who you are, church members or church pastors, you're not the number one person. Because who is the head of a church? Jesus, right? So you're always number two person at best. Right? Yeah, and, and that person realizing, oh yeah, I'm not in charge. Jesus is in charge. I just need to listen to him, be connected with him, listen to him, and do what he says. And that person shares with me, oh, man, that was intense relief of what the pressure that he was feeling. We're not in charge. Even in this life, we're not in charge. God is in charge. And our job is to be connected with God and, and receive His marching orders and do what He is telling us with the fuel that He provides. You know? That's so important because a lot of times we just think Right? In a humanistic way, say, oh, I just need to hear what my boss is saying. I just need to go and do it. No. Even though you may hear it, you might not, you will not be able to do the things that he's telling you because it, it is a God's instruction. And that requires God's grace in order for us to do it. That's why Philippians 2.13 says that, that God is working in you to give you his desire and the power to do them. So we need his desire 
right? And his instructions and his power to accomplish the things that he is telling us to do. Doesn't matter how little or how big those things are, right? We need his instruction. We need his fuel, his power to accomplish the things that he is telling us to do. You know, you know that's why Romans 10, 9 talks about that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. And it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. Our justification, our salvation, right? And it's not just talking about, oh, Jesus is Lord. You know, when they were able to say this, they're putting their life online. They're putting their life on the line, their life on the line, and they're willing to die because in that time, right, who was the Lord? Caesar was the Lord, right? Caesar was the Lord, and if you say Jesus was the Lord, basically you're saying, I'm willing to die for the things that I'm willing to say. And if you're not secure in your relationship with God and your eternal life, how can you say that? Only when you are secure in your relationship with God that when you die, like Paul, to live is Christ, to die is gain, right? unless you are certain of that, you will not be able to say this. You know, willingly put your life on the line. And, and, but people deny the truth of Jesus' lordship. Right? Right? And, and when you think about it, in your life, or in your perspective of this universe, who's sitting on the throne? Who is sitting on the throne? When things go bad, you know, I often tell them like, hey, you know, you're sitting, who's sitting on the throne? You look at the, look at the heaven and who's sitting, Jesus is sitting on the throne. Uh, he hasn't lost control of anything. Yeah. And the reason people don't want God to exist is the fact that if God does exist, Right? God must sit on the throne of all lives. Right? And, but in order for me to sit on the throne, what do I have to do? Intellectually, I have to deny the existence of God. So there is a huge incentive for people who are not Christians to deny the existence of God. Do, do you see that? Right? Because intellectually, I cannot honestly and say, oh yeah, God exists, but I'm sitting on the throne. That doesn't make sense. Right? In order for me to sit on the throne, right, I have to deny the existence of God. Intellectually. Right? Even in my mind, maybe, maybe I have to, uh, whatever positive thinking or negative thinking, depends on the, what your perspective is, I have to think again and again and again and again. Oh yeah, the master is me. I'm the master of my universe. You know, I'm the king. I'm the lord of my life. Right? I am God. We need to reinforce that again and again and again and again and exist, uh, denied the existence of God. Are they justified? Are they saved? Oh, of course not. They deny the existence of God. They deny the Lordship of Jesus Christ. What is their end? What is their end? Yeah. They will not triumph. Right? Yeah. Even though they may seem like to have all the fun right? or enjoy life to the fullest or they may seem living a free life. Wow, they're so free. They do whatever they want. They say whatever. Go whatever they want. You know, and they even talk, Brian talking about their steward, you know, stewarding their resources, whatever they want. But, the, but the, their end is destruction. One of my favorite verses in Proverbs 14, 12 is that there is a way they seem right to a man. Yeah. I guess for women too, right? There's always picking on men here, you know? Yeah. Yeah. There is a right, there is a way that seems right to a man. But in the end, it leads to death. It leads to death. Yeah. Without God, without acknowledging Him, right? right? right. Without reckoning with Him, right? Right. thinking, oh yeah, you know, He just died, so I can do whatever I want. Right? Denying His Lordship, His Master over our lives, it will lead to death. You know, God's words lays out 
two clear destinations for living a life, right? right? There's that one that leads to judgment and destruction and that leads to eternal life. And, 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 and simply, I know sometimes that kind of question, it could be daunting for you guys. Which one do you want? I said, I didn't say, it. which one do you have? Which one do you want? A life that brings judgment and destruction or the life that brings eternal life? Which one do you want? Eternal life, right? Yeah, you know, when we say eternal life, where do you think that that came from? It came from God. God gave us His desire. God worked in us. It wasn't you. Because, right? No man seeks after God. Not even one. No one is good. Right? It's a work of God that God comes and lays before us His will and His power to live such way. And, and, and the flip side is that if you don't want eternal life, you know, I struggle with this every day with my kids. You know, I have two kids, and every day I'm checking up on this thing. Because I want to see the work of God. Right? Is God working in you? Is God residing in you? Giving them the will of God. And giving them the power for them to live such a way. Right? And, but if you don't have it, it doesn't mean that you're over. If you don't want it, what happened? You have to... Pray to the Lord. You have to ask God, God, please work in me. Please work in my kids. For them to be soft. For them to be removed of this heart of stone and give them this heart, this, this, you know, the, the, the heart of softness in order for them to understand God's word, understand grace, and understand how God has sent His Son, Jesus Christ. We ask God to open our eyes or open our spiritual eyes to see the glory in the, in the cross of Jesus Christ who died for our sins, that forgives us and to draw us and how God has given us this gift of salvation. Even seeing salvation as a gift, that is the work of God. There's everything else in this world we have to pay for. There's no free lunch, right? Even I buy you lunch and I say, hey, you know, I, I, I pay, you pray. You, know, kind of, you have to work, you know, in some sense. Yeah. So this kindness of God, this goodness of God, this work of God that may lead us to repentance. Repenting from not believing in Jesus Christ. Repenting from being the Lord of our own lives and receive Jesus as our master and the Lord of all. And these two realities of what your desires are Right? And even that you, you don't want this yet, and how you see the scripture and you see the two distinctive differences in their destinations, and how right? we must ask God to work in us so that we can experience the eternal life that God is willing to give us. Amen? So it's not in them. We ask God for mercy, we ask God for His grace, we ask God to work in our lives. You want them to experience eternal life and how we cling on to the Lord. And we, we check up on them. We ask them to, to cry out to the Lord as well. Yeah. So we now see the example of people who perish. Right? Just very um, you know, simply, I'll just read 5 through 7 and verse 11 to give you like flavors of these three groups of people and these three individuals who were destroyed. Right? Though you already know this all, I want to remind you that the Lord delivered His people out of Egypt, but later destroyed those who did not believe. You know how Israelites came out, but none of them went to, well, you know, under 20, except Caleb and Joshua, right? They didn't enter the promised land. They all died. They waited 40 years for them to be, you know, be dead so that God would take the new generation and Caleb and Joshua to the promised land. Right. And the angels who did not keep their position of authority but abandoned their own home. This he has kept in darkness, bound with everlasting chains for judgment on that great day. Right? This one third of the angels, they fell because they were prideful. They want to be glorified. They want to be their own God in some sense. And they fell with the Satan and they are kept and later they're going to go to hell. 
the hell wasn't created for people. Hell was created for fallen angels to go to. And those fallen angels are really mad, right? Right? They will do everything to take away the great possession of God, which is people. And that's why Second Corinthians 4, 4 says that how, he, how the work of uh, Satan is to, to blind us so that we may not see the glory of Jesus Christ. Verse 7 talks about, in a similar way, Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding towns gave themselves up to sexual immorality and perversion. They serve as an example of those who suffer and punishment of eternal fire. Yeah. So group number three, right? This punishment of eternal fire in Sodom and Gomorrah serves as an example. Yeah. Sin is rejecting God's word and God's ways. Right? And saying their way is better than God's way. Their way is right. And God's way is wrong. And people in Sodom and Gomorrah live such way and they were punished. And they serve as an example Right? How this, you know, Proverbs 16, 14 works out, where there, there seems to be a right for a man, but that way leads to destruction. That way leads to destruction. And this verse 11 is the kind of the, the, the core, the crux of what, what Jude is trying to say. Right? It's the key verse in this book, giving us a strong warning. I have so many different warnings. Right? It says, woe to them. Right. Very opposite then, bless them, right? It's the extreme opposite of woe to them. For they walk in the way of Cain and abandon themselves for the sake of gain to Balaam's heir, right? And perish in Korah's rebellion, right? So this, this Cain, right? This Balaam and, and Korah, right? It gives us this bad example, right? These individuals. Jude used Cain to illustrate unbelief because he did not submit to God's will for him. He was a self-righteous person and he killed his brother Abel. Right? And individual number two, Jude used Balaam to illustrate unbelief because his behavior was a direct result of his lack of submission before God. He was a greedy person. Right? The, the, he didn't take the financial piece that, you know, that Brian's teaching. Right? Person who lusted after money and compromised the reality. Right? Jude used Korah to illustrate unbelief because he tried to make wrong right and right wrong. Right? He was a presumptuous right? and he rebelled against Moses and Aaron. Right? And he's tried, right? And he's tried uh, received this fire from heaven and consumed 250 of them and ground split open swallowing their families and people who associated with them all their end was destruction it might be a little bit scary but it gives us an example of warning of there seems to be a right for a man but that way leads to destruction it is just destruction and what does these examples provide for us? It shows us very clear, very clearly, the end results of unbelief, right? And very opposite of the blessing of the saints and the glorification of the saints, right? These examples pushes us away from unbelief, right? And, and towards us, towards God, right? in these three specific applications I'm going to share. Right, it comes from verse 20 through 23. It's very simple. When you read it, you can kind of tell. I put in different colors. So there are three specific applications as we read this. Building yourselves up in your most holy faith. That's our application number one. Number two, praying in the Holy Spirit. And number three, keep yourself in the love of God. And I kind of lumped it up together. You can kind of make it into a list of six. But over here, you're kind of talking about this future salvation that we will receive. Remember, salvation is always in three aspects, right? That I was saved, I, I am being saved, and I will be saved. And, and this is more of a futuristic thing where, right, the, that mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. In, in this future aspects that we will receive these things, right? So the first one, it involves building ourselves up in your most holy faith. This comes through spiritual growth. Right? That takes place by walking by faith, not by sight. Right? We are God's temple and the 
evil one is working hard at it to bring destruction that we must strengthen ourselves spiritually right? right exerting great strength in order for us to build like a building right how do you build a building right right you have a foundation but it's an ongoing process it takes time but it's easy to destroy right but it's very hard to build Right. And so you have to understand the foundation of the gospel and his ongoing process will never be at end on this side of heaven. Right. So it's always doing little by little ongoing process, be in this process of building us up, building each other up. Right. So it involves building ourselves up. Number two, it says it involves praying in the spirit. Right. True believers are not devoid of the spirit. Yeah, and sometimes when you think about spirit, you may think all those movies that you saw, you know, all the kind of the, the very charismatic kind of things that you may be accustomed to. But spirit is a third person in Trinity, right? Spirit is God. So you can kind of simply read by right praying in the God, in, in the Lord, praying in God, right? We have him and we can pray in him for his desire to be manifested in our lives. Right? And God is the greatest resource that we have in our connection with God. And that's what prayer is, right? Prayer is not just going some place or, you know, place time where you just say whatever you want, like a vending machine. Prayer is a connection with God, right? That we have in Christ, in Holy Spirit, right? And that's why praying without ceasing is a key in living in relationship with God. Spiritual maturity, right? I read one of these books talks about how do you know you're mature, not mature. And, and the book talks about spiritual mature. Mature Christians, they live in awareness of God. They live in the presence of God. They do life in God. They, they even come into worship service, right? We pray where two or three are gathered in your name. You promised us that you will be here. So we say, thank you, God, for being here. And we worship God as though he is the one who receives our worship. Not evaluate. I don't know about that Paul guy, you know. I don't know about that Yongsu guy. He's funny a little bit, but man, he can't even speak English, you know. Or uh, well, Greek, or oh, forget it, you know. Right? Are we here for ourselves? Are we here in the presence of God, Christ, who's sitting on the throne, and we give all of our lives, all of our breath, all of our talent, all of everything we have to bring maximum glory unto Him? Isn't that why we gather together? And that's why when we are a little bit off, or, you know, maybe I'm a little bit tired, whatever it is, we can forgive one another, but our intents, right, our intention is to glorify God. Yeah. And that's why we have to, right, the connection with God is on. Doing life in awareness of His presence. In growing in maturity. In loving God and loving one another. My third application is a little bit long, right? It's because the verse is a little bit longer. But it's looking to the future and believing in the future. This requires keeping ultimate reality clearly. Ultimate reality of not just right now, but ultimate reality, what we will be, right? The one day Christ will come and he will establish new heaven, new earth, and new everything, and new in his kingdom, right? And looking forward to that and setting your present day on that course. Do you see? It's not like, oh, before I die, or before Jesus comes back, one day before, and I just kind of repent and be on his side. No, even starting right now, if we really, really believe that in future, that Christ is going to come, he's going to establish this everything new, we, you're not, you're today, be aligning to that. But if you're today is not aligning to that, you don't really believe that. You really don't. Right? Because even in our reality, how we live now, that's, how, how, that's not how we live. Yeah. Let's say there's a fire coming, you know. Let's pray for continue to, uh, those firefighters. And people say, come and evacuate. The fire is coming. Right? Then what are you going to do? You better evacuate. 
You better get your passport or whatever that one box that you have, you know, and get out. Right? Right? And if there will be a shortage of water and gasoline, what are you going to do? You're going to go Costco buy some water. Right? And you know, some movie or some concert of your favorite band is coming, what are you going to do? You're going to go buy tickets and make sure you go see them. Yeah. If you know the future reality of God's kingdom, will you not invest in that kingdom starting today, starting right now? If we really believe that God's kingdom is come, He's going to be here. Kingdom is going to come forever and ever. Will we not? Will we, will we not invest everything we have in that kingdom? Yeah. Of course we will. In love, that's what the Bible talks about. Being loved by God. Oh, there's so many things I, 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 can, I can say, you know. But that's the most important thing. Knowing the future reality and how that drives our present reality as well. You know, Jesus is coming back, right? He is. And He's going to establish His kingdom. Yeah. And how today's life, we want to, everything we do, we want to align to that future. He talks about evangelism, right? snatching them out of fire. Right? It's just a wonderful application that we can uh, listen. And again, not just by our own power, but asking God's grace to to, 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 to affect us, to come upon us so that we can accomplish right, His will. Because when we do the things that He wants us to do with His power, who gets the glory? God does. And our life is all about bringing glory to the Lord, that we are created to glorify God in our perspective, right? in our uh, these and all the things we do. So this purpose of letter, contending for the faith, right? This exert intense effort in your relationship with God, right? right? It's, it's, it's pursuing Christ hard, right? Just like when you're dating, do you remember, you know, like you were pursuing hard for that woman or for that guy, right? Maybe you might not say it, but then it's giving the signals, you know, whatever, you know? Yeah, but exerting intense effort in your relationship with God. And these examples are people who perish. Yeah. Who go against God and you play God, you will perish. All right? Proverbs 14, 12. There is a way that seems right to a man, but in the end, it will lead to death. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, the, and the, um, the rest of the applications are given in 20 verse. So, so let's pray together with the ushers come forward. Father God, we thank you so much for this short letter, but how impactful and how it is filled with your instructions and challenge. But the grace that you give us, even in verse 1, talks about how we are being kept by Jesus Christ. Uh, Father, thank you so much for working in us. Uh, Father, thank you so much for giving us clear instructions and even how we can come before you for you to grace upon us in order for us to live this life for your glory's sake. Father, we acknowledge that you have begun a good work in our lives, but also we are confident that the work you have begun, that you will finish it until the day of Jesus Christ. Help us to have this eternal perspective of your kingdom coming. May we align everything of ourselves today, right? align to that reality, right? contending for the faith, right? and, and pursuing you hard each day of our lives. Father, we thank you. In Jesus Christ, let me pray. Amen.